Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Got a few announcements before we uh, get started in our worship service. Now remember today is uh, Mother's Day and uh, we have a special collection offer opportunity for you for Rain Tree Village. And uh, if you can help out with it, uh, give that uh, your money to Tom Durden or one of the elders. And we will make sure that gets to the right place. Next weekend is the Rose Show in the Fellowship Hall. And that goes on, uh, looks like Saturday and Sunday. The Silver Wings will have a, uh, they'll tour the Rose Show at 3.30 and then they head over to Broadway Diner uh, for dinner on the 19th and says there is a sign-up sheet uh, for that. Also remember on Friday night, Youth Night at 6 p.m. A lot of you have been asking about the uh, Wisconsin mission trip and we have set some dates for that. Uh, the dates are uh, the 22nd, that is a, a, a Sunday, thank you. That is a Sunday. It runs from the 22nd through that Thursday, and uh, we will leave either on the 20th, uh, on Friday, or Saturday the 21st. That is to be determined. Uh, the, we have about a room for about 10 people on this uh, particular trip, so make sure you see Jim Pelfrey if you're interested in going on, on that, that trip. Again, we want to remember... Uh, Teresa Green and Sadie Moreland at the loss of their sister, uh, Marie Sneed, and her funeral will be on Saturday at 1 p.m. That is at Hope uh, Funeral Home here in Fayette County. Let's begin with a prayer tonight before we uh, enter into worship. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to come back into your presence tonight and worship you. Father, our desire is that everything we say and do is in accordance with your will. Father, be with those men that will stand before us tonight and, and lead us in this worship. Father, be with Dave as he presents another message to us. All these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. First song this evening will be number 383. Number 383. We might be using our books. <laughs> nope. There we go. All right, 383, if you would, please stand. I have a home prepared where the saints abide Just over in the glory land And I long to be by my Savior's side Just over in the glory land Just over in the glory land I'll join the happy angel band just over in the glory land just over in the glory land there with the mighty host i'll stand just over in the glory land i am on my way to those mansions fair just over in the glory land there to sing god's praise and his glory share just over in the glory land just over in the glory land i'll join job and just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. With a blood-washed throng I will shout and sing, 
just over in the glory land. Glad hosannas to Christ the Lord and King, just over in the glory land. Just over in the glory land, I'll join the happy angel band. Just over in the glory land, just over in the glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in the glory land. Please be seated. Number 500. Number 500. This will be the psalm before our prayer. O thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove. While the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Our great and almighty Heavenly Father, we come to you this at this time thanking you, Father, that you are our Heavenly Father. Thanking you, Father, for so many blessings that you bless us with daily that we take for granted. Father, we're thankful that we can come and worship you on the first day of the week without any outside interference. We're thankful, Father, for our homes and for all the things that you give us in this life that we enjoy. We're thankful most of all, Father, for your son that gave his life to establish the church and give us hope of eternal life if we live according to your will. Father, we come to you this afternoon thanking of those of our number that's suffering with sickness. We pray, Father, that you'll be with each one, that you might bless each one with a 
portion of their good health, that they can enjoy the things that they enjoy in this life. Father, we pray also for those that's lost loved ones that you'll continue to comfort the family, Father. We're thankful, Father, for the congregation that meets here, and we're thankful for each one that makes up the congregation, make up your uh, church here, and we pray you'll continue to bless each one, Father, and help us all that we might draw near to thee and do all those things that you would want us to do to be good citizens of you as a good Christians. Father, continue to be with us this day, continue to be with us this coming week, and well, Father, we pray for our president and his cabinet that you might give him the wisdom that he needs to to rule and, and, uh, and to, uh, uh, at this time, to run the, uh, uh, this country. Father, we pray for the other countries that's, that's having problems that you be with their leaders, that they might all look to you, Father, for guidance, which you only, you're the only one that knows the future, Heavenly Father. We pray for our men and women that's serving in the armed forces, that you'll be with them, that you might strengthen them and protect them, and pray that soon that they'll be able to come home and we be with their family. Father, we're thankful for our elders here that oversees this congregation, that you'll continue to bless, bless them with good health and wisdom that they need. We pray for our deacons that you'll bless them and, and help them to do the task that has been set before us. And Father, we're thankful for our teachers and each one. Pray now, Father, that you'll be with us at this time and, and watch over us, forgive us of our sin. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you're using your songbooks and would like to mark the song of invitation, that will mean number 667. Number 667 will be the song after the lesson. And the song before our lesson, number 531. Number 531. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the height. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, O ye stars of light. Let's see if we can raise that. Oh, excuse me, lower it. <laughs> Let's try the first verse again. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the height. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, for he is glorious, never shall his promise fail. God hath made his saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the God of our salvation, host on high, his power proclaim, heaven and earth and all creation, Lord and magnify his name, hallelujah, amen, amen.
evening. I hope you brought your Bible with you. I did not give Denny a list of scriptures tonight to put on the board. He may catch up with me. He usually does, but take your Bible and turn to the book of Matthew, if you would. We'll be in chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18. We'll pick up in a moment at verse 21. You may recall several weeks ago, we posed a question, I think it was on a Sunday morning, we asked, what if I don't feel forgiven? I've sinned, I've gone astray, I've done wrong, I've corrected my life, I've repented of my sins, I've confessed them to God, but what if I don't feel forgiven? Tonight I'd like to turn the table, so to speak, for just a few moments and look at the matter of forgiveness from the other perspective, that is from the point of view of the person who has been done wrong rather than the one who has done the wrong. What if I don't feel forgiven? What if I have trouble forgiving? Take your Bible and read with me in Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21. The English Standard Version says here, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. He began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. And then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger... His master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive from your heart. It's been well said that the sin of unforgiveness is a cancer. A cancer that destroys relationships, that eats away at a, a person's own Psyche that, that consumes you from the inside out. Worst of all, it shuts us off from God's grace. Have you ever noticed in your studies of the scriptures that neither Jesus nor any inspired writer ever approved of getting even with someone who's done you wrong? There's not a passage that says when somebody does you wrong, you go and get even with that person. You go and do wrong to him so that you're even. Not a passage there. There's not a passage that approves doing an injury to your enemy or taking revenge on someone who has, has wronged you. That lowers you to their level. Forgiving you sets you above that person that, does, that has done you wrong. You see that thought expressed in kind of a humorous way. Mom and Dad were listening to a little four-year-old say his prayers, and they learned that even a four-year-old can pay attention in worship. As they listened to the little boy begin to say his prayer, 
they heard him pray, Father, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. Now maybe he didn't get the words quite right, but he, got, he nailed the sentiment, didn't he? Having a forgiving heart, a willingness to forgive, that's an important goal for Jesus' people. God wants his people, his children, to model in this world an attitude of forgiveness. How many people have you encountered in the course of the last week, just in the last week, who were not willing to forgive? Maybe it was in traffic. Somebody cut in and the guy laid down on his horn and maybe uh, waved in a rather rude way. And you could tell from the expression on his face and the motions of his mouth he was saying things that weren't too polite or printable. He wasn't very forgiving about being cut off by one car in traffic. Maybe somebody put some extra work on your desk on the job and you don't feel very charitable toward that individual or maybe somebody got a little benefit of some sort at your expense having a forgiving heart is a good thing in the eyes of Jesus we see that very clearly in the text that we read a little while ago in Matthew chapter 18 we commonly call that the parable of what? The parable of the unforgiving servant. He received a blessing, but he wasn't willing to extend a blessing. What I'd like for us to do for a moment tonight is to look at some of the lessons that we can learn from that parable that we can apply in our own lives. And so let's start by simply pointing out in verses 21 and 22, Jesus taught forgiveness. Peter asked him a question, how often should I forgive my brother? How many times should I even forgive him? Seven times? You know, in the Jewish mind, that amounted to perfect forgiveness. I have forgiven him seven times. After that, I don't have any obligation. And what did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. Do the math here. Peter's going, 490 times? No. No. That's a hyperbole. Jesus isn't giving a numerical standard. He's giving a moral standard. As many times as he offends against you, sins against you, and genuinely repents, forgive him. Now, Peter's question was a loaded one. It, it almost seems as if he has somebody in mind when he asks the question. Maybe it was his own brother. We don't know what the exact occasion of the question might have been, but Jesus might have used that special number in speaking of forgiveness on some earlier occasion. Luke chapter 17, verse 4, if he sins against you seven times in the day and seven times turns again and says, I repent, forgive him. Oh, that's, that's hard for Peter to swallow. But then Jesus pushes it much farther than that. Peter's answer to his own question reflected a, a, a generous improvement over the general rule that many rabbis taught. Many of the rabbis said if he sins against you three times, cut him off. That's it. Well, Peter was willing to go twice that and then some. But then Jesus pushes him farther than that. His answer was plainly not what Peter expected there in verse 22. Instead of putting a, a cap on forgiveness, instead of saying, okay, this is all you have to do, and when you reach this point, you don't have any father obligation, what did Jesus do? By giving this, uh, we might almost say ridiculously large number, what he was doing is emphasizing that we should all be in the habit of forgiving others. Think about this. Jake, can you imagine trying to keep track of the number of times that Kendall has irritated you until 488? 
489. Ooh. And here's Carson back here thinking, Tucker, 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 Tucker. What if you lose track? Oh, now I got to start all over again. That's not the point, is it? Can you imagine trying to keep track of somebody's wrongs up to 490 times? You wouldn't have time to think about anything else, would you, Tom? We need to remember, forgiveness is a vital part. It's a key component of Jesus' plan for the church. What did he say in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14? As you're praying, here's how you pray, and what's one of the things you pray for? Father, forgive us our trash baskets, our debts, as we forgive those who trespass or are indebted to us. Look at the last part of Luke chapter 6 and verse 37. He says there, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Do not condemn, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive. You know, if, if this was going to be uh, point, counterpoint in each case, it would be forgive, and you shall not be forgiven. But that's not what it says, is it? Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Look also at the words of Ephesians chapter 4 in verses 31 and 32. There, the apostle Paul writes, Let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Pause there for a minute. Have you ever known an angry Christian? Sure. We've encountered angry Christians before, haven't we? If you've been in, in, in the church any length of time, You've had the occasion of bumping into somebody that just seems like they were born on the boil, quick-tempered, ready to fight. But is that a healthy thing for a child of God? Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. What did Peter do in the garden? Lord, do you want us to smite with a sword? And he pulled out a sword and... Choo, took off the ear of Malchus, servant of the high priest. He's ready to fight. He had to learn some patience, didn't he? Had to learn some forgiveness. Put away these things. Maybe your temperament is to be short-tempered, to be impatient, to get mad quick, to kind of thrive on drama and strife. You know what? As a Christian, that's not a good thing. But you can change that. Paul says, put those things away and be kind to one another, verse 32. Kindness doesn't come naturally to everybody. Some people have to really work at it. It takes deliberate thought. It doesn't always feel natural. But he says, be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another just as God in Christ forgave you. Who are you? Brother Stan, you're a Christian. Amen? Amen. What does that mean? That means you're forgiven, doesn't it? God in Christ has forgiven you. What a blessing Stan has received. As God in Christ has forgiven you, and now I'm not speaking just to Stan, I'm speaking to everyone, so you also, I also, ought to forgive. Sometimes it's a challenge, isn't it? Sometimes that's not what we want to do emotionally. But that's what we need to do. 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13 tells us that we are to both forbear or endure one another and to forgive one another because Christ has forgiven us. The first thing that we ought to notice in this parable there in verses 20 and 21 and 22 is that forgiveness is presented as a key quality, a key component, a fundamental part of who you are as a Christian. Are you a forgiving person? And if you're not, what are you going to do to change that? But notice next in verses 23 down to 35, and we won't take the time to go back and reread this since we've already read it, but notice there that Jesus illustrates in a very vivid way what he means by forgiveness. Now the contrast in this parable is in the amounts that the two servants owe, one to the master and one to the fellow servant. And I'm not going to, to, I'm not going to tax my own brain by trying to figure out dollars and cents in this figure. But rather than be dogmatic about the dollar figures, let's simply point out that 10,000 talents here is actually a weight of money, not 10,000 pieces of silver or gold. A talent was actually a, a volume of weight. And so when you have 10,000 talents, even in silver, you have a staggering sum. We don't know if this guy had borrowed what amounted to millions of dollars or simply hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe it was billions if it was gold. But this man was indebted to a figure that he couldn't live enough lifetimes to repay. On the other hand, a hundred denarii, a hundred pence, the King James Version says, a hundred pennies, well, those were Roman coins. That worked out to about three and a half months worth of wages. I don't know how much you make in three and a half months. It's more than enough to buy dinner. And, you know, if, if you owed somebody 14 weeks worth of pay, that would make a significant dent in your budget, wouldn't it? But it's not insurmountable. We borrow more than that to buy an automobile, to buy a house, sometimes even to take a vacation or something like that. We're confident that we can repay it given a little time. And we do, don't we? We live in an installment culture. So we ought to be familiar with that whole concept. The exact amounts here are not important. What's important is the, the contrast. Here's one man that, that owes a little bit that he could reasonably, expect, reasonably be expected to repay. Here's a man who, you have to wonder, how did he ever get so deep in debt in the first place? But he can't live long enough. There aren't enough lifetimes for him to, to ever even make a dent in repaying how much he owes. Roughly speaking, we could just say the difference is $100 million versus 100 bucks. What's the point? Well, the point in the parable, the application, is this. We have sinned. And because we've sinned, we owe more than we can ever hope to repay. What's, what's the payment? What's the penalty? What's the price of sin? From the very beginning, from the day that God made man, the price of sin is the life of the sinner. What did God tell Adam and Eve in the garden? In the day that you eat this fruit, in the day that you sin, you got one law, don't eat this. When you do, you'll die. You'll be separated from God. Fellowship with God will be broken because of sin. And the only price that we have at our disposal 
is our own lives. The price of sin is the life of the sinner. But by God's grace, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, our debt is forgiven. The free gift of God. Well, that's what this master does with the servant that owes him 10,000 talents. He gives him a gift to wipe off that debt, to just write it off. Think about how staggeringly wealthy the master had to be to absorb that kind of loss and just let it go. Sometimes we'll sing, Gone is all my debt of sin, a great change is wrought within, and to live I now begin risen from the fall. Jesus paid it all. Because God was willing to forgive our debt in sin, what's Jesus telling Peter back there in Matthew chapter 18? Because God is willing to be generous with us, we ought to be ready and willing to forgive those who offend, who sin against us as well. The great lesson of the parable highlights the the hopelessness, the helplessness of a sinner who does not have the blessing of God's grace. We understand that, that sinners are lost, condemned without the blood of Christ. We get that. The life of the sinner is the price of sin. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, we read that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Go on into chapter 10 and you find in verse 4, without the blood of bulls and goats, it's impossible. Uh, it rather, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. That's not enough by itself. Go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 though, and what does John tell us? That Jesus Christ washed us with his own blood. He did pay the penalty for us. What those passages teach us is the necessity of blood for forgiveness. And that price has been paid. Now let's apply what we've seen in a, in a practical way. Very simple. What does it mean to forgive someone? Someone who's done you wrong. Who's offended against you. What does it mean to forgive them? Is it possible? Can a person really forgive and forget? No. Wait a minute, I thought that's what church was all about. Even God does not do this literally in the way that we think of it. The book of Genesis, just to illustrate the point, the book of Genesis records the fall in the garden, the sin that caused all the mess in the world today in the first place, that opened the door to it, records many other sins that have already been forgiven. But they're not forgotten, are they? Because they're, they're, they're right here, written down for us to read and, and for us to learn from. When Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 31 and going down to verse 34, uh, writes about God creating a new covenant and no longer remembering sin, those words mean that God no longer counts it against us. It doesn't say that the memory of it, the knowledge of it doesn't exist. It says that the guilt of it is removed from the record. He no longer counts those sins against us. He treats us as if they'd never occurred. We need to learn to do the same thing. We sometimes talk about being justified from sin. And what, how do we explain what justified means, Brother Rick? Just as if I'd never sinned. That's right. 
That's what we're talking about tonight. That's the lesson that Jesus was teaching Peter. To be like God. To be ready. To be willing to be the one who, having experienced someone else's wrong, having suffered someone else's sin, Jesus is teaching us to be the one who's willing to forgive, to treat it as if it had never happened. That doesn't say that we don't have that hurt, we don't have the consequence of it, we don't have some injury or even loss. But we're not going to count it against that person anymore. What if I don't feel forgiven? Maybe it's because the person who says, I have forgiven you, hasn't actually done it. You see, when Jesus says until 70 times 7, what he's doing is giving us a standard that ought to cover our whole lives. Giving us an example, an illustration that ought to impact every situation from now until eternity. Until 70 times 7. How willing to forgive am I? God has forgiven me. How can I then turn and hold something over someone else when it doesn't come anywhere near the level of what I have owed to him. When you look at yourself in the mirror of God's word just now, what do you see? If you hold this up as if it were a mirror and you measure yourself against the image there, you see what you ought to be there, and you look at yourself and you know what you are, how do you measure up? Are you someone who stands in need of forgiveness from God? Or are you someone who stands in need of forgiveness from God because you have been unwilling to forgive someone else? The gospel invitation is yours now. If you're someone who needs to become a Christian, who needs to take the steps that are outlined in the scriptures, if you want to make the repentance of your sins public and make a public confession of your faith and be baptized into Christ, everything is prepared. Don't waste this opportunity. God is willing to forgive if you're willing to come to him. But if you have done a brother or a sister or a family member, a loved one, a friend, a co-worker, if you've done them wrong and you have not made that right, you haven't corrected what you can correct and asked forgiveness for what you ought to ask forgiveness, you need to do that as well. Maybe it's purely a personal matter between a husband and a wife or a brother and a sister, a neighbor and a neighbor. And if that's the case, go handle it one-on-one. -on -one. That's what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18, earlier in the chapter. But if it's something in which you need help, or maybe you're the one who was done wrong and you're struggling to come to that point of forgiveness, the person is asked and you're finding it hard to, to fulfill that request. You need to cast that care upon the Lord and ask for His help. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, it's our privilege to offer you our prayers as well on that behalf. Jimmy's going to come forward now and lead us as we stand together and sing. If we can serve you in the Lord's invitation in any way, we invite you to come. Wonder-working power, 
in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Number 384. If you didn't have a chance to take the Lord's Supper this morning, it's been prepared for you. If you'll make your way to the front pews, we sing the first verse of 384. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget. Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Please be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, Father, and for everything you bless blessed with. Lord, we please ask that you bless this bread, Father, and that uh, those are, that are about to partake can focus their hearts and minds back to the cross and the body uh, that Jesus broke on the cross for each and every one of us, and that they may take in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We bow me. Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue this memorial feast, we thank you for the cup that to us as Christians represents the blood that was shed on the cross. Please let us take it in a manner that will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, we're thankful for everything you've blessed with, and Lord, we pray uh, that as those are, that are about to give, Father, they will do so cheerfully, and Father, that you please be with the ones uh, that, are, that are overseeing this contribution, Father, that you give them guidance and wisdom to use these funds, that we may continue the work and continue to grow the borders of your kingdom, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Number 611. Number 611 will serve as our psalm for our prayer. Do we have any announcements that we failed to mention? Anything we need to be reminded of? All right. All right. 
visitors, thank you for your attendance. Um, stick around for a little while. Allow us to introduce ourselves and make you feel welcome. If you will, please stand. We'll sing the first and fourth, first and fourth verse, and then be dismissed. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. At the name of Jesus bowing, falling prostrate at his feet. King of kings in heaven will crown him when our journey is complete. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that we've had today and the many blessings of it. We thank you for the opportunities that we had to come study the Word, and thank you for the lessons that David has presented to us today. Pray, Heavenly Father, to be with the sick, especially ones that have been mentioned and ones in the bulletin. Be with the ones that will be traveling this week and giving them a safe trip to and from. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll go with us now, guard, guide, and direct us, and bless us, and keep us, and bring us back on Wednesday evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.